this next speaker uh, that I would love to introduce is pretty exciting um, because when I first started my teaching career as a maths teacher, I remember the first day I walked into teacher planning and they gave me a third of a piece of A4 paper and on that piece of paper it said, this is your unit plan for the next six weeks. And it said, exercise 15. In week one, you cover one, two, three, and four. In week two, you cover questions 2A, question 2C, and 2D. Make sure the students know how to do that. And then, you know, it went on and on and on. And I had just left uni feeling super excited about teaching maths and all of the connections with real world. And I was asked to teach kids how to answer multiple choice questions in my classroom. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome someone who was really inspirational to me as a maths teacher in my early career, and uh, that is Eddie Wu. Can we give Eddie a massive standing ovation, please, as he comes to stage? Wow. Uh, good afternoon, guys. It is such a joy to be here with you to talk about something that is really close to my heart, which, as Maddie has just mentioned, is mathematics. Now, I get it, I get it. I, I've had the privilege of traveling all around this country this year. I've hit almost every major city, um, every capital city, I should say. And it's been a huge privilege to do that, but as soon as people find out I'm a mathematics teacher, people decide the way they're going to interact with me. And as someone who's not just a mathematics teacher, but also a dad, there are three kids, they're age five, seven, and 10, and they keep me on my toes. I've kind of characterized the different ways that people interact with me sort of as animals. Those of you who have children around that age know all of children's television completely dominated by animals, right? Particularly pigs, like there's Peppa Pig, there's Olivia, there's... Anyway, so animals, okay? Here are the three kinds of ways that I tend to feel people respond to me and my subject. Number one, and this doesn't happen very often, but it does every now and then. I can even see a few in the crowd right now. There's the people who are like, yes, maths. And they do look pretty much like that. They're like, oh, you too. And it's very exciting for them, right? Hooray for the nerds. Good on you. Now, that, that happens every now and then. But, but it is much more common to get a response a little bit like this. So, this was the experience I had of mathematics all the way through school. And I hold you personally responsible. This is much more common than the previous one. But more common than both of these put together is, well, what, what does this have to do with me? I wonder if you thought that when you had a look at the session outlines, you thought, OK, what's this guy going to talk about that has some connection, some relationship to me? Now, I'm going to throw that straight back at you before I answer this question, OK? Here's the question I want to put to all of you. Your subject, whatever it happens to be, your area, the thing that you really love, why is it that you teach it? Why do you teach about essays? Why do you teach about Shakespeare? Why do you teach about design? What is it that grabs you about that? What is it that you hope your children, your students will become? That's a really tough question to answer. I want you to answer that because when, when people picture mathematics, they picture this, right? That's why most people have their ostrich head in the sand. But I think there's something more to mathematics. And I think there's probably something more to each of the different subjects that you teach. Here's the way I want to think about it. Etienne Wenger really understands this. He's a Swiss researcher. And he puts context, he puts learning in the context of identity. Here's the way he says it. Learning is transformative about who you are. Here is why. It changes, it transforms who you are and what you can do. That's the way you describe yourself. Who are you? You introduce yourself. I am. I'm a teacher. I'm a researcher. I work with the deaf and blind. These are things I can do. They're part of your identity, whether you like them or not. He goes on. It's not just, I've got more facts. I've got more skills that I can do, more things in my tool bed. It's more than that. It's about, I'm learning English to become a certain kind of person in my control of language. I'm learning visual arts to avoid becoming a certain kind of person who sees all this creative expression around me and doesn't understand it. I'm becoming a mathematician because, hmm. Lastly, this is, this is his point, right? We learn, learning is not an end in itself. Learning is a means to an end. It's in the service of identity. Can you think of the way that what you teach every day in your classroom changes fundamentally the identity of the students who are there? 
If you can't answer that question, then you have some thinking to do. I'm going to help you think about that in the context that I work in, and that's, of course, mathematics. Now, I want to talk about three aspects of identities in the 20 minutes and 55 seconds that I have left, which maybe you wouldn't think of naturally connecting with this subject, playfulness, curiosity, and openness. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get straight into the first one, which is playfulness. Now, I mentioned before the ages of my children, 5, 7, and 10. I spend a lot of time around playgrounds. One of the things that I notice is whenever I pull up to a playground and I stop the car, I haven't even hit the handbrake yet. My kids jump out of the, the back seat. I don't have to tell them, go and play. I don't have to demand, OK, now, kids, we're going to have to spend a whole hour here, all right? Go off, play. No, I don't want you to come back until you're done. They just do this naturally. It's instinctive. It's innate. Playfulness is a human characteristic. And it's not just for little, little kids. I'm a secondary teacher, right? And so play has a very definite meaning to kids in the secondary space. These numbers here, 18.9 million, 18.2 million, these are hours. And not just hours played. We love playing so much that we will watch other people play. And the kicker is, those 18.9 million hours on League of Legends, they're not hours watched in, say, you know, over the course of the game, or a year, or a month. This is over one week, my friends. We, we are people who love, yeah, I know, right? We are people who love play so much, this is how we can quantify it, right? Now, for this reason, I was really perplexed when I heard first from the mathematician and educator in the US, Dan Finkel, and he said this, and I was so perplexed when I first heard this because this was nothing like what my experience of mathematics was like when I was at school. I remember a lot of tests. I remember a lot of formulas. I didn't remember much play at all. Maybe you feel the same way, and so I'm going to try and ease you into this, which is why on your chairs when you came back, you might have noticed a piece of paper. You thought, I didn't put that there. You're right. Sonia very uh, artfully ninjaed that onto your chair. And yes, ninja is a verb, just, I just made it up. You're going to use that piece of paper to play a game with me, and I'm going to teach that game to you. It's called Mean Boxes. Now, I wonder, could by show of hands, could you indicate to me, have you ever played the game Boxes before? Hands up, straight. Yep, most of you. Oh, awesome. OK, thank you, hands down. You might have heard it called Squares or Paddocks. Very simple game. For the few of you, maybe you're from somewhere else and you've never played this game before, let me walk you through it. And in fact, as I walk you through it, I would love you to do this with me on your piece of paper. To play boxes, what you do is you turn to the back of the book in the subject in which you are currently bored, and you draw some dots, like this. I've got four dots across the top, and I've got four rows of said dots. Okay? And then you turn to the person next to you, and if they're willing to play, then this is how you play. You each take a turn. That's a turn. There. I join two dots together. One turn. Right? You take a turn. They take a turn. You take a turn. They take a turn. You take a turn. And as the name of the game suggests, the aim is to make boxes. Very good. Now, it doesn't matter who made all of those lines there. Whoever makes the last line, they earn the box. So I would put you know, the letter E in there, Eddie. I claim that box. This game is very simple. All you want to do is get the most boxes. Okay? But I told you the name of this game is not boxes. The name of the game I'm going to teach you is mean boxes. Now, I don't mean mean as in cruel, uh, though over the next couple of minutes, you may well be very cruel to the person next to you. I'm talking about mean as in a mathematical mean, a, an average, right? Now, for those of you who uh, don't know about averages, I will school you up in this. But before I do that, would you punch some numbers in between those little dots there? You can put these numbers in if you like, or you can come up with any ones that you prefer. Any numbers will do, literally any numbers. Now, how do we play this game? Well, to calculate a mean, for example, if I wanted to know the average, the mean height of the people in this room, I would start measuring. You know, I'd take the, the first three of us here in the front row. I'd take those, I'd add them together. You can use your phone for this if you want, no big deal. You add them, and then can anyone tell me what I do last to get the mean out of this? Yeah, I divide by the number of people that I've got, or scores. So I would divide by three in this case. That gives me a mean height and average. Now, your goal here is not just to get more boxes. The gears turning. Your goal is to get the boxes that will give you the highest mean. That means some boxes are advantageous to get. Others, not so much. In fact, you probably want to corner your friend into getting the zero, because what will happen if you get an extra box around the zero? What happens to your mean? It goes down. You get an extra box. Yay! No, wait. 
you add nothing to your score and you have to divide by a larger number, your mean will be less, okay? I'm going to give you two and a half minutes with the person you see next to you or the person behind you to play this game and see who is the best player. Off you go. Don't stop playing. Keep playing, but listen to the sound of my voice as you play. One of the interesting things about this game, which I observe every time I play it, and you guys just did it, is that the game starts off so carefree. And then about a minute or a minute and a half into the game, it slows down dramatically because you realize it's on. And I'm going to crush the person next to me if only I can get that nine. I'm going to give you 30 more seconds, sudden death. Don't be precious about it. Make a winner, please. All right, I'm so sorry to do this to you. It is criminal to give you such a short amount of time. Now, I wonder, over the top of that funky music, I wonder how many of you noticed the dominant sound in the room as you were playing that game. Did you notice? Or were you too busy trying to destroy the person next to you? That sound was laughter. That sound was laughter. Um, half of it was that sort of maniacal laughter, like, ah ha ha, I have definitely defeated you. The other half was the kind of, <laughs> uh, you'll pay for this on Monday. Now, uh, you see, this is a perfect example of a low floor, high ceiling task. Easy to get in, easy to get in, right? All you need to do is start drawing lines, but easily extendable too. I gave you whole numbers, I left them all positive, more or less, but if you wanted to make this more difficult, it wouldn't have been challenging. You could have thrown some fractions in there, some negative numbers, some percentages if you, someone's gonna put pi in there, I'm sure, right? Go to town, whatever you like. You see, playfulness, that idea of just mucking about and seeing what happens, is so often the seed of mathematical thought. Playfulness. That was the first one. Does anyone remember the second one? Ah, curiosity. Now, I love showing this picture to a room of adults because I don't have to explain like I do to kids that this is JFK, he was a president of the United States, back when saying that was a compliment. You guys know who this was, right? Um, but, of course, you need a reminder that JFK was famous for basically two main things. The first one, unfortunately, was, was being assassinated, but the second one, was he get, said he got up in front of Rice University and gave that very, very famous speech where he said, by the end of this decade, we are going to land a human being on the moon, right? Amazing feat. And this happened, well, next year, it'll be 50 years ago that this happened. An amazing feat of human engineering and ingenuity. Now, what I want to ask of all of you is, why did we go there? Why did we do it? I mean, I know you can have a cynical answer about that, you know, about the USSR and the Cold War, etc. but, at a human level, why did we do this? Why would anyone care about doing this? Uh, tremendously expensive, great risk to human life. I mean, I, I love Apollo 13. I'm a, just sort of a diehard Tom Hanks fan in general, but it's just a great movie, and it puts to you just the immense danger that we put human beings in to achieve this. Why did we do it? And I think we kind of all deep down know that as human beings, we are curious creatures. We can't help but be curious. And you see, curiosity is a disposition, it's an attitude, a mindset of the heart that leads to mathematics. Benoit Mandelbrot was a mathematician who understood this, a uh, Polish-French mathematician, which is why I say his first name the way I do, Benoit, and he understood the power of asking very simple questions. Questions like, looking at you know, an image like this. Questions like, is an object like this, a river delta, where the ocean meets land, is this a kind of geometry that can be understood and expressed in a mathematically logical way? Because the geometry that all of us learnt at school was about triangles and rectangles and circles, perfectly straight or perfectly curved lines, none of which you can see on this picture. And yet it's hard to deny there is a geometry pattern there of some description. What is it? And the mathematics didn't exist when Benoit Mandelbrot asked this question, so he invented it. And we have a, new, a whole new area of mathematics, which we call fractal geometry, which now enables us to understand so many things around the world, including these trees all around us, behind us, all made of the same stuff. The blood vessels coursing through your body right now all trace out that exact same shape. See, curiosity is a powerful driver for mathematical thinking, but not just that. I want to show you what this looks like in my classroom. But first, I, I, I think you need to understand Curiosity is a kind of weird sort of ethereal thing. You can't quite grab it. It's like the wind. 
right? You can't tell someone to be curious. All you can do is create the environment around which it can be created. I don't know if that's my agricultural high school background coming through, but I think it is very true. When I look at my students, you can't demand curiosity of them. What you can do is feed them things that help them become curious, cultivate their own curiosity as it is, and this is one of my favorites. Could I get a show of hands? Has anyone seen this picture before? Hands up. Keep, put your hand down if you're a math teacher. Okay, no, that's fine. I just wanted to get a sense. That's fine. The vast majority of you have never seen this before, so let me talk you through what's happening. You have this, um, you have this shape which is divided into four, and then those four pieces move around. But when they stop moving, something unusual emerges. Did you catch it? I admit it's a bit hard when everything's all moving about, so let me just hold it still for you. The area of a triangle, somewhere deep in your repressed memory, you remember is half times the base times the height. Now, you've got a grid up there to help you sort of count what's going on. If I'm counting right, it's 13 units across, five units high. Yeah, can you count that? Half of 13 times five, half of 65, I think that's 32 and a half square units. But that guy down the bottom seems to have a hole punched in it. It seems to have an area of 31 and a half square units. Now, I apologize, it's mostly for the sake of time, but you're gonna hate me a lot in about eight seconds because I'm not going to explain <laughs> what's going on. I'm putting this here just to show you the power of curiosity. You want to know what the Dickens is happening here, right? You want an explanation. That's why curiosity is powerful. And even if a long time ago, a long time ago you might have decided mathematics probably wasn't for me, I wonder if this reaches at something deep in your soul that's still there that maybe you forgot about. Curiosity, immensely important disposition in mathematical thinking. And we talked about playfulness, we talked about curiosity. Does anyone remember what the last one was? It was openness. Fantastic. Now, um, this man is named Keith Devlin. He's a mathematician from Stanford University. And he said something to me once that I'm sure no one in this room has ever heard before, which is, over breakfast, he told me, almost none of the problems that he has to solve as a mathematician, but really, none of the problems we as human beings are trying to solve in the world, almost none of the problems worth solving today have just one solution. Now, the reason why it struck me when he said this to me is that, at least in the mathematics space, we often give things exactly opposite to this. We give all of those problems that have exactly one solution, and that's why it's at the back of the book. That's why it's in the marking guidelines. It's how you know to give it a tick, right? And Keith said to me, you know what? And you think of things like the United Postal Service, trying to make things as efficient as possible, save money in all, the way all their trucks are going around North America trying to deliver parcels. How did they do it? Well, they realized this was an open problem. It wasn't just one solution to this, and they were willing to look outside the box a little bit, and they realized, I'm amazed by this. I have to get this right, because Americans, you guys drive on the right-hand side of the road. So they worked out that they would save millions of dollars every year in petrol and a few other things if they always turned right. No matter where they were going, no matter where they needed to get to, very Zoolander way of doing things, they'd always turn right to get there. I always wonder who smiles and gets that joke, but anyway, that's fine. I'm a Ben Stiller fan. <laughs> now, that doesn't seem like it should make sense, right? Seems very counterintuitive. If you want to go left, and I'm suggesting to you you should go right three times to get there, how can that be cheaper and more efficient? But maybe if the cogs are turning, you realize some of the reasons why. If you're going to turn left and cross traffic, what's the likelihood you're going to be do, able to do that immediately upon arriving at the intersection? Not that likely. You've got to wait. So you come to a stop. And what happens when you want to start up again? Well, you hit the accelerator, and that's when all the petrol is used. What about the, the other thing that happens when you've got tens of thousands of these trucks going everywhere around the United States? What's bound to happen when you're crossing traffic? Well, you're probably going to have an accident at some point, and that costs thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. The cost saving is immense because we regarded this as an open problem, one which didn't have one solution, one where sometimes the counterintuitive ones are the most powerful. Now, I have four and a half minutes left to try and put you in the position of solving a problem like that. So I want to introduce you to one of my favorite kinds of shapes. This is a pentomino. Um, you've heard of dominoes, right? Dominoes, dominoes have two squares attached together. We usually put numbers on, but you know how to have to. This is a pentomino, no numbers. It's not two, but five squares all put together, 
Okay? Now, this is one example of a pentomino. Many of them look different, but they are actually the same. Can you see how these two are the same pentomino? What would you do to the first one to turn it into the second one? What would you do? Yeah, I can see you doing it with your hands. If you just spin it around, bam, you're there, right? No matter how many times you spin this, you'll never get to that, but still, it's the same shape. What would you do instead? Yeah, reflect it across, flip it, same deal. But it doesn't take that much imagination to realize there are some that are truly different. Now, this is an open problem. There are at least two kinds of pentominoes. But I wonder if you'd be willing to turn that piece of paper you've got over to the other side and have a new blank slate and try to work out how many pentominoes can you come up with? I'm going to give you a fast 60 seconds to see what you and the person sitting next to you can draw. How many pentominoes can you think up? Good luck. Off you go. Could I get a show of hands? I'm pretty confident. Even in that small space of time, could you give me a show of hands if you got at least four different pentominoes? Hands up. So that's double the number. Keep your hand up if you got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Any hands up? Twelve? Thirteen? Are there any hands up left? I'm impressed because there are exactly twelve. Well done. Okay, now, what I love about this is there's always someone who's got like, I have fifteen. It's like, I'm sorry, no you don't, but good try. Now, what I love about this is we're talking about collective genius today, right? No one got to, or maybe a couple of people got to twelve, but as a room, I checked and I saw. We had the twelve as a room. We had the 12. Now, believe it or not, this is just the warm up to the real open task, which I'm not going to give to you just yet, but there are 12 pentominoes on the screen. Each one has five squares on it. So, flex your brain a little bit. How many squares are on the screen right now? There are 60, right? 60. Now, mathematicians, we love the number 60 because 60 can be very neatly divided into different groups. You could say 1 times 60, 2 times 30, 3 times 20, 4 times 15. 5 times 12. Now each of those is a grid, like a rectangle that has 5 by 12, and there are 60 squares, or a rectangle with 4 by 15, so there are 60 squares. Do you think you could rearrange these so they would make a nice, neat rectangle? Well, spoilers, you totally can. And what students love about this is that they come up with solutions and they all come up with different ones. You see, these are open problems, like the real problems that we have to solve out in the world. And so, to close off, because I've desperately run out of time, we've talked about three aspects of identity here, right? We talked about the mathematical thinking is playful because it pushes you to experiment and explore. We talked about it as something which drives curiosity because that's what wants, makes you help, help you to understand something truly because you're you're curious about it. You're not just content to know it is. You want to know why. And lastly, it's about openness. It's about a perspective that enables you to look at problems and say, I wonder what if this is the solution or if there's another better way. And that's why when I think about mathematics and you, I'm willing to say, I think it's awesome. Thank you so much for your time.